Hello. Hello. Very nice to see you all, and uh, great to be here. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I want to start somewhere I'm sure that no one else is going to have started at any point in this, in this conference, and that is um, with the barbaric men of ISIS and the Islamic State movement that I'm sure you all have seen on the television. I have just got back. In fact, I am still jet-lagged from a, a flight from Moscow, where my wonderful organization oversees a, a national dialogue between the United States and what was the Soviet Union, now Russia. And in that conference with several ambassadors there from both sides, there was a deep conversation about the Middle East and the process and what the, what the two countries could do together. And one of the conversations that just struck me, I wasn't going to say this, but it struck me was remarkable, was they said, we said, how did ISIS begin? What happened here? And the Russians would tell the Americans, told the Americans, well, it's because you bombed Iraq and you stopped paying the armies. Well, so what? You know, why is that important? <clears throat> well, because those fighters who were no longer being paid in the Iraqi army, which is essentially an Iraqi movement, needed money. And this other movement, as I'm sure you've also heard, has money. And they, then they said, somebody, one of them said a strange thing. He said, you know, these terrorists have homes, and they have families, and they need payments. Some of them have mortgages. I mean, get that, right? That's a kind of unusual. When I have a, in my head an idea about what an ISIS fighter is, I don't think of them as having paying taxes, having mortgages, and families. In fact, it is true. Why do I say this? Because there is a sort of universal about families that is, exists even in those most extreme places that I would hardly dare to go, but I just point it to you that there is a kind of universal moment about families. Everybody has them. Everybody wants them. So all the things that we've heard about is true, and it's actually even true in terms of the missing art of global diplomacy. There is a need, in fact, for the idea of the family, not just to be limited to the kind of discussions which we talk about here, but how do we actually think about that in terms of framing national debate, framing international debate and global, global polity. So I, I just throw that out as a first one because I think it's a fascinating piece that we might want to consider at some point. Secondly, I would like to say that I completely in, in, endorse everything else that everyone else has said about what families are and how important they are and the point of marriage. Um, and in many ways, uh, I, could, I don't want to, it doesn't bear repeating, I would bet that 100% of the people at this conference think almost the same thing in those, ter th those kinds of terms. But I do have a difference because I do not think uh, for instance, Colette's 80%, I'm sure I know that's, that's true, I've heard it elsewhere, and I, it's a very powerful statistic that if you, you know, 80% of people would be, uh, you, you're much more likely to grow up out of poverty if you get married, basically, that's the story. And it is true. However, it doesn't work to tell someone who's dating someone else, well, if you get married, your kid will be less likely to, be, to grow up out in, uh, in poverty. Because they don't think like that. They're thinking, do I love him? Will he be nice to me? Those kinds of issues are the ones, <clears throat> will he be ethical? Those things are the questions which people actually ask. So as a, as a, as a debate, a conversation in a think tank, it's great. But on the ground, it doesn't work. And I believe what we have to do, I believe it, but I think we have to start with that as the end point, not as the, not as the beginning point. And I am much more interested in my work, and we work on 45 campuses in my organization, in how to develop ethical identities and paradigms amongst the young, both men and women. It is a critical factor, and less about whether people have to get married. That should be something which will happen when they realize that it's going to be better that way. But if you start there, mm, it's not going to fly, and it has that sort of sense of negativity about it. It just won't work, in my opinion, even though it's true. So that would be my second point. Back to my moment on campuses. I've been involved in campus work for a few years now, and um, fully a third of women identify as having had unwanted sexual attention or rape on campus. So as uh, I think it was Judith was saying, that is a, a remarkable statistic, a loathsome statistic, and there was a famous moment in the campus, I think it was Alabama, which we were involved in where the, the lights were turned off as the whole campus was gathered in the room, and people spoke 
Everybody was there. Who was raped? And in the darkness, people say, could say in front of the whole campus, this happened to me. And there were hundreds of women talking in that moment. Now, this, to my mind, changing that is to change the development of family, or to, 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 to progress the development of family. That is what we must do to develop, and I'll go into just for a second about the, 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 the paradigms that we need to create. How do we do this? Well, in my opinion, and sometimes this clashes with the general direction other people go in, we need women's leadership well beyond the family. I think there's a kind of tendency to think of women's leadership in these forums as something that happens over here, but over here in Congress, over here in the public in, in sphere, of, for that matter, in diplomacy, women's voices, well, they'll bring the softer side. Mm -mm. I, I, I mean, it's a complicated thing, and I can, you could probably see it both ways, but in my opinion, since most of these issues are actually male issues, male inequities, male immorality, frankly, it is female leadership that will change that because they have a wider perspective. Now, how do we therefore get out of that, get out of the patriarchal attitudes that we have because that's what's keeping that leadership back? Now, I leave that fourthly with you. And I don't know the answer and I think it can be controversial and difficult to handle, but I think if we don't think of it like that, we'll get stuck and never quite get out of the idea, um, uh, never, never quite get out of the problems we come to. Finally, um, and this kind of summates my thinking on when I was considering it. How many more minutes do I have? Two? One and a half. One and a half. <laughs> I think overall, it therefore behooves us in each of these areas, globally, in the family itself, campus life, public life, to focus less on the form and more on the depth grammar of people's relationships. All of those things are true that we have heard, and all of that stuff that we, we believe is right, but how do we get there? Not by saying, you must be married, or, or this is what defines a marriage even, but this is how you grow up with an identity that will be just and honest and not hurt people. And those kinds of things that are clearly in my text, the Bible, I'm a priest, I've been marrying people all my life, um, but that understand where people are coming from and develop, especially in men, this identity that we need. That's the, that's the core vision. I think that I have. If we focus on that depth grammar and less on some of these outside pieces that seem very important to us but in the big sphere of stuff are going to get us there less quickly, then we will develop a more ethical society, which is Al's. If you look at the introduction that Al gave us, it's in the book, he's talking about the, 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 the development of an ethical society. That, not the form, will get us to where we really want to go. Thank you.